No. Are some of you all never been here? Right. Any hands? Never been here. So basically, we are an unusual place. We are a public foundation. We survive on the community support. And we're all about water and rocks and plants and animals. And we have the good fortune of having Chuck and William and Mary be really behind us in developing our content on water and rocks. We've got lots of things going on. Our website talks about a lot of it. Uh, some of it is hidden, uh, but. Sorry, get you in camera because you're so good looking, Brett. <laughs> well, again, uh, welcome to those of you on Zoom and those of you here uh, at Rockfish Valley Foundation. Uh, this is our fourth or fifth Zoom since COVID hit. So you might say that COVID has taught us to do programs better than we knew. But really, the reason we're able to do a successful program today is because of the content, how important the Rockfish Valley and Nelson County are for geology, and the fact that geology is a subject of interest to so many people, particularly at the college and university level. And we uh, know that there are a number of schools in the area that present geology to the students, JMU, Washington and Lee, all the way to Virginia Tech, but one is very special and that is William and Mary. And William and Mary is very lucky to have a professor who grew up in Crozet. Uh, his name is Chuck Bailey. Uh, you're going to be uh, educated with him and then you will become one of his fans. Chuck <laughs> has brought his students. Chuck has bought property in Nelson. He sleeps under the stars. I want to introduce Chuck. He can tell you about anything he wants to about himself, but we are honored to have Chuck's work here and we're honored to have Chuck here. Uh, the secret is that Chuck and his students have produced a trifold. And that trifold has been printed by TNN Printing in Charlottesville. It opens up like an accordion. It shows a map which he and his students created. My wife and others helped edit text, but basically, Chuck and his students created stops out on the walk for individuals to take one of these from a kiosk and really learn about the place at various points. And that's the study lesson. But we are very lucky today because the guy who created this is here with us. And without further ado, uh, Chuck Bailey and Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. And it is great to be uh, in the Rockbridge Valley on a, a beautiful December day. And um, I am excited about the fact that we got this sort of done. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But first, there should be a disclaimer. Um, you guys out there in the Zoom world um, probably need to see this as well. So have a look at this, disclaimers. Uh, this is something that uh, I was told uh, a while back by an unnamed geology major from the class of 2018. Hey Chuck, last year in structural geology class, you just winged it every day. Like you were never prepared for class and your lecture was pretty much never organized or easy to follow. I know that because I'd see you in your office lamely trying to put together something right before class started. <laughs> All right, so you know, it maybe it's easy to come here, but can't say, oh, but that's not it. Here is another one uh, on one of my course evaluations. I thought professors were supposed to answer questions and teach, 
Professor Bailey asks more questions than he answers. Even when he answers a question, he'll follow up with another question. It's completely nuts. <laughs> so at that level, that may indeed be what you're in for. So I am going to ask a lot of questions. And I hope we can have um, some discussion. And when you read this guidebook, when you take it on the trail, you will see that there are questions that remain unanswered in that as well. And to me, that's kind of part of the fun of doing science. We don't know all the answers. And, uh, you know, maybe down the road, if we ask enough questions and think about it in a smart way, we can answer many of these things. So this is a sort of accordion style trifold, as Peter mentioned here. And I'm going to talk not so much about this during the talk today, but for those who want to go on the walk later, we will go to some of these stops and you can get a sense of that there. But um, the base map for this is one of the things that I want to want to talk about. And so the base map is, is shown here. And we are, at least if you are in the building, not on Zoom, are right here at the Rockfish Valley Natural History Center and Spruce Creek Park. And the green represents all of the trails. And for me, what is so important about this trail network is that it provides public access to you know, the community here to actually see one of what I think is a, an extraordinarily scenic region of Virginia. And public space and public trails are, to me, hugely important if we are going to appreciate the outdoors, the environment, the water, the rocks, the geology. So there you have it. And I also have to say that this has been an ongoing project. And at William & Mary in the geology department, we have only undergraduate programs. We do not teach graduate students. So I started this kind of relationship with the Rockfish Valley Foundation really back in 2019. And here you can see my field methods class sort of striding boldly across Spruce Creek Park. And invariably in these individual classes, we make some advances and then the semester ends and people move along. But this past summer, I worked with another team of William & Mary research students working a little bit to the east, definitely in the Rockfish Valley drainage, but not necessarily the drainage right around here. It was a little further east near Schuyler. And these are the infamous Schuyler sisters. Some of you may have read about their exploits. So I want to thank them because this wouldn't happen if it hadn't been for uh, a bunch of William Mary students working over the past few years. And one of the great things about sort of modern college students is that they do feel a sense of purpose about communicating what they do to a broader audience. So that to do science in a can is not enough. Um, there has to be kind of an outreach component. And I am learning that as I have gotten older and older. So let's first kind of establish place. And if you think about the drainage basins of Virginia, um, most of what we have in Virginia drains towards the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Although we can end up in the western part of the state, the New and the Tennessee and the Big Sandy, which all drain towards the Mississippi River, ultimately. But we're going to focus on a small part of the James River Basin. And that small part centers around right here in this corner of Nelson County. And that is the Rockfish River. And the Rockfish River drains from the crest of the Blue Ridge. So the northern part of the drainage basin is up here at Rockfish Gap. Uh, Along the crest of the Blue Ridge, you can almost follow it if you come down the Blue Ridge Parkway for the first 20 miles or so. And then the Rockfish has a North Fork, a South Fork, oh, you can see it better here, a North Fork and a South Fork. They come together, the Rockfish is whole, and it debouches into the James River at Howardsville. And there's a lot of great geology to see from one side of the basin to the other. Um, there are geologic changes, the landscape has a distinctive character. But for our talk today, I'm going to focus really on what is known as the Rockfish Valley, which is in some ways the low terrain, kind of at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so we're situated along the South Fork here. But if you came down 151, Alcohol Alley, you also are in the Rockfish Valley there as well. So we're going to cast our gaze on that part of the terrain. So how did we make this map? And again, I hope you get your hands on the accordion trifold at some point and really look closely at it. What this is, is a shaded relief map. And what that means is that I have taken uh, a digital image of the landscape using something called LIDAR. And LIDAR is a method that's been developed really over the past 20 years, which allows us to sort of survey the landscape at a much more detailed resolution than we used to have. And the way it's done is typically an airplane flies over, you're actually bouncing a laser off the surface of the earth, 
it actually uh, reflects off the trees too. And if you do this the right way, you can end up producing um, elevation data that is really good to about, oh, 10 centimeters, all right, a few inches. And then you can compile that digitally to make fabulously detailed maps of the Earth's surface. And if you shade it, uh, what I've done here is I've shaded things based on how steep the landscape is, and then also what the orientation of those slopes are. So one of the things that comes out, this is just the sort of raw digital elevation model shaded relief map. You can see highways very well, all right? So this is Route 151. And this is the junction right here with Devil's Backbone. All right, that uh, gives you a sense where right here, you can see great detail with stream channels. So here is the South Fork of the Rockfish, and you can see the meanders and the wiggles. The steep slopes are the darker areas. We're gonna visit one of those on our, our little walkabout uh, later. And so this level of seeing things on the landscape is something that earth scientists have finally got to do um, in the last sort of 10 years. And we're learning lots and lots of cool things that we didn't know before from this kind of stuff. We can also take these digital maps and do other fun things with them. So I've added color to this map right here. And now you'll notice that 151 is kind of labeled. But what I've done is I've taken all the areas of low slope and I made them white or gray, okay? So this is a slope as degrees. So a two degree slope is relatively flat. And you'll notice there's a wide swath of fairly flat ground right here. And then the steeper slopes are in the yellows, oranges, and reds. And so this is kind of a, a classic scene for what the Rockfish Valley is, right? We've got uh, a broad flat area with the river and the streams in it. And then it's sort of bound by steeper terrain on either side. Hopefully that sort of jives with the landscape you know from around here. Um, so let's go back to the, the title picture that I have here. This is a photograph from the Rockfish Valley Trail. And it was on a February day. There was ice up high. The clouds were kind of blowing off. Um, I had left Williamsburg in a miserable cold rain. And by the time I had gotten to Nelson County, the rain was gone. The sun was coming out. Very great. But lo and behold, you can see that here in the Rockfish Valley, lots of. I need a little. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and then as we look about here, you know, I really, in all directions, there are much, much steeper slopes. So that leads to a question. Why is the flat ground flat? Okay. So, you know, we have this vast expanse of flat ground along the river. Well, why in the world is it flat? Um, the river was bigger once. That's interesting. Someone may know where we're going here. But these are the kinds of questions that at one level seem pretty simple, but these are the kinds of questions that I really love to ask, all right? And then sort of prod around and see, what do we really know about, well, was this slope to start with and became flat over time? Um, and how would this change, you know, if we were to go forward in the future? So let's try to explore that a little bit. Well, one of the ways to explore that is to think about the third dimension, okay? Um, and what we're going to do, this is the trail map again, but I want to draw your attention to this line right here. And this is not a very clever label for it, but that says A, and that says A prime. And we are going to draw a topographic profile along that that may help explain kind of the landscape that we see here, okay? So our next view is going to be a slice along that line. You with me? Get a few head nods back there, okay? All right, voila. Here we go. So a few things I should give you a um, fair warning about. This cross section is vertically exaggerated. So what I actually did is I stretched, but whoa, I stretched things that way. All right. When you're my height, you probably would like to be vertically exaggerated. But the idea is that um, it's not quite to scale, but you get a sense of the landscape here. And everything that is shown in the green color is effectively terrain where the bedrock would be either exposed or very close to the surface, okay? Oh, you'll notice that right here, it's quite steep, yeah? Indeed. And then as we cross the, the wide Rockfish Valley, I have portrayed this with this sort of thin smear of yellow. And that thin material there is something that geologists would call alluvium. And alluvium, 
is sediment, effectively. And it is sediment that has been deposited by running water, uh, perhaps Reeves Creek, South Fork of the Rockfish River. And these are all um, sediment that is left behind as flowing water stops carrying. I'll show you a picture of it there in a moment, OK? So here in the Rockfish Valley, there are really two important elements on the landscape. We have the bedrock, which is what most people think about when they think about geology. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we also have these streams and river systems, which are transporting and moving debris that is provided to them. And as that debris is provided to them, things happen to these sediments. They're rounded, they're broken into smaller pieces, and they are left behind on the landscape. So I would argue that the broad, flat valley that is the Rockfish Valley is flat because the river deposited a layer of sediment or multiple layers of sediment there. And in these places, we are actually disguising or burying the underlying material, which are shown here in the green. All right. So picture of alluvium, I promise that. Voila, this is a picture of Rockfish River alluvium last week. Very little Rockfish River right here. And what do you notice about the alluvial materials right next to the river? They are somewhat rounded. I can hear it in the back. They're not exactly square or angular. Some of them might be quite rounded. And some of them are volleyball size, baseball size, grapefruit size. And so alluvium can actually be sediment of any size. So here along the Rockfish Valley, the current, when it flows and floods, is sufficiently uh, vigorous that you can transport cobbles and boulders like this. In Williamsburg, which is where I live most of the time, the streams can basically transport sand and silt. And so we don't see big cobbles like that, but all of it is still alluvium, all right, just in different environments. All right, so now we have our, our mind's eye around alluvium. So we're going to get very technical now. I would like to present a simple model for stream systems, all right? And this simple model is one we're going to think about and see, well, what do we think is going on here in the Rockfish Valley system? So one thing, well, OK, let me stop. And, and maybe I should try to define these terms first, resisting power and stream power. Now I'll start with this one. A stream has a certain amount of power that it can use to modify things. And the amount of power that it has is really controlled by two important variables. How steep the stream is and how much water is in the stream. The more water and the steeper the slope, the more powerful the stream is. Um, so you can imagine the Niagara River, lots and lots of water, all right? When it goes over Niagara Falls, it's very steep, very high stream power, okay? And then you could argue there is something that we might think about as a resisting power. And that could be the nature of what is underneath the stream. Is it cotton candy or is it granitic bedrock? And what you might envision is that if these two are not actually equal, things will happen on the landscape. It'll be dynamic. So in this instance, imagine we have a situation where the stream is less powerful than kind of the resisting force of the landscape. What's likely going to happen in this situation is the stream will not be able to transport all of the sediment that comes from upstream. And if it can't transport it, if it can't move it along, any ideas on what has to happen to this stuff? It settles out. It has to settle out. It has to get deposited. So you could envision on this landscape, if this was the case, that over time, the level of the valley would basically get higher and higher and higher as the stream left behind more and more and more sediment. And we call this process aggradation, right? It's not a very uh, euphonious word, but the idea would be that over time, you are, there is deposition and the valley is being filled up with a very deep fill of sediment. And that's kind of exactly the opposite than this. Notice what I've done here. I've changed the colors on you. All right. That's the, the, oh, we got to wake up. Change this color on us. Can't see it on the Zoom. The color here is green and it says stream power greater than resisting power. And if this is the case, the stream has got more than enough power to do the work on the landscape. And in this instance, we would predict that if this was our original valley, our vigorous 
highly powered stream would start to incise or erode down through the bedrock and take all that sediment away. So this would be our original valley and now, oh, and are we gonna deposit much sediment? No, you're gonna remove it and you would end up with lots and lots of bedrock probably being exposed. So incision and aggradation, two possible models for how a stream could work. But there is a third one here. What do you think would happen if these things, the stream power and the resisting power were effectively in balance? If this is the case, you might argue that you're not gonna deposit a great deal of sediment. And you're also not gonna down cut into the underlying bedrock significantly. So if that's the case, what can your stream do? It can go back and forth and back and forth. It can meander across the landscape. And so in this scenario, we might argue that over time, we would continue to make a flat area along the valley without it incising or necessarily depositing thick layers of sediment on the edge. So three different models here. Got them in the big brains of yours? All right, I see people out there in Zoom world. Oh yeah, I see some of you. Um, so here's our original picture. So I'd like you to just take a moment. And if you're willing to talk to people around you or if you're on Zoom, you can talk to yourself. Um, what's going on here in the Rockfish Valley? All right, is it incising? Is it a grading? Is it lateral planation? What do you think is actually happening out there? All right, we got one vote for lateral planation. And what's your evidence for that? Flat. <laughs> it's flat. Okay, what do we got here? All three. You want to go with all three? Oh, yeah, we are all right, aren't we? Everybody gets an A. Um, and then during Camille, it would have been incision. Okay. Because it was going very Yeah. Well, you're right. This is where I ask bad questions, too. I don't think that, that I probably have some sports evaluations to tell me that. Because the amount of stream power is going to change from moment to moment, day to day, things like that. And you could argue that there are times when absolutely the Rockfish River would incise into its channel. And as those high flows go to low flows, they will leave behind sediment. Um, and I would argue that, yeah, I think that what we see overall is that there has been significant planation across the Rockfish Valley. And I can also tell you that the uh, thickness of the sediment here, it is not that thick, five, eight, 10 feet. It's not a hundred feet of gravel in the bottom of the Rockfish River. In fact, if you wander around the river itself, sometimes you can even find bedrock there. So, oh, oh, here we go, another question. So what controls how wide a valley is? So here's a picture from kind of the other side of Nelson County, Gladstone, Virginia. And this is the James River. And the red arrow is kind of the width of the James River and the floodplain, okay? And they built the uh, railroad tracks kind of right along the edge of the floodplain. And this is probably about a half a mile wide. Well, why isn't it a quarter of a mile wide? Or why is it not two miles wide? You know, what is controlling the width of that floodplain? Okay, it may have something to do with the nature of the landscape, kind of the, the material properties, the resisting forces. I think that could be one of the hypotheses. And this is the kind of stuff that has made earth scientists um, curious about the landscape and the world around them for, you know, all the way back to really the 18th and 19th century. And so we're going to go back to the uh, 19th century to G.K. Gilbert, who was one of the first to sort of articulate some of these terms. And you can see he had his pre-pandemic beard all going good. <laughs> and he argued that the width of a floodplain is a function of one of three factors. All right, it could be the lateral erosive forces acting on the valley walls. So kind of how vigorous the stream is, that's maybe the stream power part. The resistance of the bedrock, which I heard out there in uh, the audience. And so the more resistant bedrock may not make as wide about because you can you have to cut down as, a, and then the last would be the duration of planation. Another way to say that would be, how long has this process been going on? Because you can imagine if this is taking place 
since time out of mind that the valley over time would get what? Wider and wider and wider and wider. So maybe the valley width tells us something about the time thing here. So, all right, well, thank you, GK Gilbert. Um, and I'm gonna introduce another little concept here. And that is the idea that some streams in the world could be underfit. And we don't need to worry about who sort of coined these terms, but the idea was, think about a stream whose modern flow or discharge is insufficient to form the valley that it is currently in. So the idea would be you have a very wide valley and a pretty piddly little stream. All right, I'm sorry if you find the use of the word piddly for a stream kind of derogatory, but you see what I'm saying? Tiny little stream in a big valley. And some people say, well, that little tiny stream couldn't actually have created this whole big valley. And most of these underfit streams have been documented, documented in places where the landscape was glaciated during the last ice age. And as those glaciers melted, there would have been huge outpourings of meltwater, which could have done a lot of work. Remember, high stream power, make yourself a big valley. And then when we move beyond that to a modern climate, you've got a big valley and the piddly little stream. All right. So see, you're learning something on this Saturday. Um, and this draws us back kind of to the area we're at here. Going back to the 1970s and 80s, a number of geologists suggested that streams draining the eastern side of the Blue Ridge have large floodplains relative to their current size and appear to be underfit. All right. And so here I've got a picture from the trail showing three ridges off in the distance, broad rockfish valley there. And this is what these people were talking about. Imagine that. They're calling the rockfish valley or the rockfish river an underfit stream. Um, so I've always found that to be kind of an interesting landscape question. And so we have attempted to try to answer that question. And what we've attempted to do is, uh, well, I just said that, didn't I? The question to answer, are Blue Ridge streams underfit? And what we've done, and some of my William Mary students have done this for their theses, is we've examined many, many drainage basins along the eastern side of the Blue Ridge from the Rappahannock up here um, well to the north, all the way down to, oh, look at this. Let's see if we can find some of our friends here. That's the Hardware River drainage, the Mormons River. Um, what's the mission of the Mormons? Oh, North Rockfish, South Rockfish, Bull Rockfish, High River. We lost the uh, E there. But the idea was, can we see things on these landscapes and evaluate whether these streams are in fact underfit? So, we measure many things on the landscape, how wide the floodplain is, how much topography, and we make graphs. And boy, have we made a lot of graphs. And these graphs are probably gonna be very stunning out there. And these plots in the science world are known as scatter plots. And the idea is we're gonna put two different variables on there, and we're gonna see if there is any correlation between one thing and another. So let's start with the plot on the left here. What I've plotted is the, the area of the drainage basin, how big the basin is, and the mean width of the alluvium, which is kind of how big the valley is. And, you know, you just kind of eyeball it. Does there seem to be a good correlation? No. no. Um, in fact, if it's truly scattered, you'd say it's a terrible correlation. So we have some uh, very, wide valleys right here with relatively small drainage basins. And we have some that have large drainage basins. So there doesn't seem to be much of a correlation anyway with this. And, and you can ask the program to tell you whether there is a best fit line. And that's a pretty terrible fit for the line, yeah? So that doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, okay, we'll try another metric here. Let's think about the mean annual peak discharge. How big is the yearly flood on some of these rivers? And you might think, well, if you've got a really big yearly flood, it'll make a big valley. And we have fewer basins where we actually have stream gauges, so our number of samples are fewer. But does that look like a good correlation? No. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I don't even really want to talk about this. One. <laughs> These look like good correlations. No. no, we made graph after graph with all sorts of things. So we looked at the gradient difference between the upload and the peak bomb. Blah, 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 blah. So we made dozens and dozens of graphs, and this is what we get. And we call these graphs scatter plot. All right. So this is not meant to be a talk on negative results. So here are actually two variables that have a positive and reasonable correlation. Um, and Let's just look at this one, all right? It's a nice glorious weekend and we don't need to be inside all this time. But we have the width of the valley here. Each different drainage basin is its own square, okay? So the south fork of the rockfish is one of these, north fork of the rockfish is another. And what I've got here is the percent of the drainage basin above 800 meters in elevation. So the idea is that the more of your drainage basin that is high up in the elevated Blue Ridge, 800 meters, that's, you know, we're getting close to 3,000 feet above sea level there. You end up with larger floodplains on average, and there is a positive correlation. All right. This other thing is called the hypsometric interval, which is a similar measure. But um, if you want to do calculus with me after the talk, we can talk about that. We get a similar correlation there. So let's sort of visualize this. The valleys that have the biggest floodplains, the widest valleys, are also the basins that have a lot of their basin at high elevation. So draining things like Three Ridges, a high mountain in the Blue Ridge, or Devil's Knob, or if you go to Shenandoah National Park, things like Stony, uh, Little Stony Man and Hawksville. And here's kind of a way to visualize this, all right? So the Robinson River is in Madison County. It's on the east side of the Blue Ridge. Hawksville is the highest point um, in Shenandoah National Park. And then Old Rag Mountain, hopefully some of you have heard of that. And what I've tried to show here in blue are all the areas that are at high elevation. And then the yellow is the amount of alluvium in the valley. And lo and behold, the average width of that floodplain for the whole basin is over 400 meters. That's a quarter of a mile. And then let's compare that to Butt Mountain Creek, which is uh, in Albemarle County, and uh, maybe Callum Bentley is out there listening to this. Uh, he lives very close to Button Mountain. Well, it turns out Button Mountain Creek doesn't have much of a valley associated with it. Width is fairly narrow, and it has a very small percent of its drainage basin that is up high. That was really the only correlation we found in doing all this, this work. So where does this leave us? Well, it would appear that the valley width of these streams is not relate to the modern hydrology or the landscape. So maybe the valley widths are related to some kind of past change when perhaps we had different climate in this region, All right? So we can't make any obvious modern correlations, but maybe these valleys are actually a relic of some other climate system, okay? And how might that work? Well, here is a photograph uh, along the Ty River looking at the Priest, which is a mountain in Nelson County. And the Priest is uh, about the highest mountain around down here on the Ty River floodplain. Oh, no, it goes up a lot there. Well, let me ask you this 18 to 22,000 years ago, this was the height of the last glacial ice age. We know that ice got to sort of New York City, covered much of Illinois, vast continental ice sheets. We also know that the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia were not covered by glacial ice. But it is quite reasonable, based on kind of the climate that we think we know from uh, climate studies, that the high parts of the Virginia Blue Ridge probably were tundra or boreal forests during this period of time. And so could that difference in climate affect kind of the hydrology and how these river basins actually form? That's kind of one of my suggestions out there, all right? Now, I think there are some positives and some negatives to that, but that I think will be one of the things we can have some discussion about as we move a little forward um, after the talk. So we're gonna shift gears to kind of a overview of the landscape and then talk about rocks. So when I'm talking about rocks, people say, oh man, I went to this geology lecture and this dude with long hair and a scary mask stood up and he didn't talk about rocks. 
So I'm going to talk about rocks. So if you need that fixed, you're going to get that right now. So this is an oblique view of a digital landscape. And let's see, out here is the Shenandoah Valley, Devil's Knob, Humpback Mountain. And then lo and behold, what is this? Where we are in the Rockfish Valley. And you get a sense that the Rockfish Valley is the lowlands, broad and flat, high steep slopes are there. But what underlies the Rockfish Valley? And geologically, it's pretty interesting stuff. So this map is what we would call a geologic map. And let's sort of zoom out to uh, a scale that we, we're, we're pretty confident on we, where we are. So this would be Afton, all right? Waynesboro, Stewart's Draft, and all of these are in the Shenandoah Valley, yeah? And it turns out in the Shenandoah Valley, there are relatively young rocks, at least regionally, exposed there. And these are sedimentary rocks, and they are younger than all of the rocks that we have here in the Blue Ridge. Um, and the Blue Ridge itself is bounded by these major ancient fault and tectonic boundaries. So what's pretty crazy is that along the western edge of the Blue Ridge, there is a family of faults, a happy family of fault known as the Blue Ridge Fault Family. And it is along these faults that old rocks of the Blue Ridge were transported up and over those younger rocks. And uh, that's really what I study as a structural geologist. So everything I just talked to you about is something I'm not qualified to talk to you about. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, but here in the Rockfish Valley is another very different kind of fault zone known as the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. And much of this fault zone actually is faithful to the low topography where the, the various tributaries of the Rockfish River are. But the other thing I want you to note on this is that this Rockfish Valley, notice it's not called a fault, it's called a zone. Yeah, we add that extra four letters, another word, right? And that's because this is a zone where the rocks have been dramatically changed, dramatically deformed, as opposed to being kind of a very discrete boundary. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a cross-section view, sort of from Devil's Knob and Wintergreen all the way down to where we are right now. And this is our vision of kind of what the three-dimensional picture is. So, oh, Devil's Knob, Black Rock Mountain. Here's the Blue Ridge Fault, BRF. And then over here in the Rockfish Valley with its little thin smear of alluvium, we have these deformed rocks that make up this zone. And so the Rockfish Valley Zone, what's cool about it? Well, what is cool about it is that it is a zone where the rocks have been transformed and look much like this. And one of the stops, I feel like I just kind of keep picking this up. Um, one of the stops on here is actually a stop where you can see rocks in the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone along the Glenthorne Loop. And we call these myelinitic rocks. And myelinitic rocks form when a rock is hot enough to be um, deformed in a ductile manner. And you can imagine, I've got lots of rocks up here and pretty well, most anything I could try to do to them right now, they're not gonna change their shape very much. And this rock feels particularly cold. Um, but if I got this rock hot enough, I think that we could actually cause this to flow in a very dramatic way if the stresses were correct. And that's really the hallmark of this Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. So I'm gonna try another way to convince you that this is cool. On the left is an image of a granite in the Blue Ridge Mountain. Granite from the Blue Ridge Mountain, right here, yeah? And hopefully if you are looking at this, you'll notice that they're kind of, it's relatively equine, the texture there. The white areas are feldspar, there are some darker minerals. And we can imagine this is kind of the original shape for this granite. I've drawn a nice little circle. And we'll watch what happens to that circle. Oh, what happens to the circle as we go to a myelinite? Yeah, so I've taken this original unit circle in our undeformed granite, and we have elongated it, we have shortened it, we have sheared it, and we've done that when the rock is hot enough to flow, and this is the end product of it. And so some of these grains of quartz that were equant in that are now long ribbons. They've really been drawn out that way. The feldspars, which are another type of mineral which are white, are broken and cracked and elongated. And so this happened right here long, long ago. 
in what would become the Rockfish Valley. And so in some ways, I would say that the Rockfish River is taking advantage of these strongly deformed rocks. And so its course parallels this, both the North Fork and the South Fork for some distance. And then to the east, it cuts out of that fault zone. So myelinites, they're there. Oh, I even have a sample of one of these. And uh, I will pass it around. I don't know if people want to all touch it, or maybe you'll just sort of loop this thing up in a hand sanitizer and send it around the room. But this is a myelite from right here in the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. Oh, truck. Yes. I have a question. So when that was happening, the key that made that happen was coming from the floor of the earth? So the question that was asked was when this was happening, and we think this happened about 350 million years ago. Where did the heat come from to do that? And it probably didn't come from the core of the earth, but these rocks, if you just were to drill a hole in the earth, Betsy, if that's what you wanted to dedicate the rest of your life to, drilling a deep, deep hole, what you would probably find is that the temperature increases as you go down. And that's typically because rocks are poor conductors of heat, but there are things in the rocks that are radioactive. And so over time, this radioactive decay happens and a little bit of heat is generated. But because rocks are very poor at conducting heat, the heat stays there. The deeper you go, typically the hotter you get. And if you go 15 to 20 kilometers down, rocks can become hot enough that if they're put under stress, they will flow. So in essence, that was kind of the, the deal. These rocks were very deeply buried when the Rockfish Valley fault zone was sort of oozing along. And it may not have actually created earthquakes as we think about faults doing. It may be that the, the fault zone just slowly creeped over time, turning these granites into these drawn out myelinitic rocks. All right. Chuck, can we uh, ask one question from our sure. listeners at home? Um, Mark asked, when choosing which stream values to include in your scatter graph, uh -huh. are you using streams of the same or similar order, i.e., fourth or fifth order streams or above a certain watershed size? So that's a, that's a great question. We were trying to have as many streams as we could. And the thing that we wanted is a stream, at least in the eastern slope, they had to drain from the crest of the range out onto the lowlands or the, the, the foothills of the Blue Ridge. So that means that they all were of a certain size or drainage order, probably fourth to fifth. But the real key for us was that that stream segment had to get out into the lower terrain east of the Blue Ridge, and it had to go all the way to the tippy top. Okay, I think I have two more slides. All right, and I'm going to give you a big change of direction here. So kind of buckle yourself in for this this one next slide because I think this last part um, will be something we can talk about for those who go on the hikes, and that is stream restoration. One of the things you will see as we wander around on the trail is that there has been time, energy, and labor put into modifying the geometry and nature of the South Fork of the Rockfish River right here. And this is a Google Earth image, Bull Rock Cider is right there, yum. And here is the Rockfish River, and there's a lot of heavy equipment that went into restoring the stream. And effectively, what is oftentimes done with stream restoration is you may plant vegetation, you may um, do a whole variety of things. But here, what was done, one of the things that was done, very large blocks of stone were placed on the banks of the river and in the channel. And placing them in the channel produces ripples. So you're actually producing a little drop in it and uh, aerating the stream and doing things like that. But my question is, stream restoration a good thing or a bad thing, all right? And you could then say, well, is the rockfish in need of restoration? All right, it has had some parts that have been restored, and then there are other parts that are not restored. And again, when we're out there, this will be one of our stops. I think we can talk a little bit more about it. But this is one of these intersections between geology, hydrology, and then effectively policy. Because we live in a world where we do projects to mitigate environmental damage, and some of the mitigation of environmental damage is stream restoration. And, you know, is it appropriate anywhere and everywhere? All right. So keep that up there when we think about questions. So, can I make a comment on that? You certainly may. Well, maybe Peter does. 
to make it. Uh, that river was one of the ones that was restored during the meal. I mean, when the army corps then came in and restored it as a straight line river. Well, the river doesn't run in a straight line, it runs in a curved manner. So the river ended up grading itself all up so it did not run. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had so many little whatevers. Right. It, it didn't run, it didn't flow, it am I saying this right to you? It didn't um, it didn't move anything along. And yeah, so you, you gotta realize that of the uh, decision to do that. But you gotta realize that when Camille hit at 2 a.m. and one percent of the population uh died. When that happened, the emotions of the area rose to where they have not been completely reset and will never. And so the government policy got the Army Corps of Engineers. Remember, there was no FEMA. There was no NOAA. There was no even weather stations that told people what was going on east of the Blue Ridge. They thought Camille had stopped in Tennessee. And so it was a total surprise. And the Army Corps came in here because of politics to try to calm down the emotions. The whole place had just been destroyed. And people had been destroyed in minds and bodies. And they came in and they had no clue what they were doing and they got their heavy equipment out on all of these hollows, all of the hollows, whether it was the tile, the rockfish, or Davis Creek, or whatever, and just dug straight lines because they could get in here quick and get out. And people felt like maybe they could have their farmland back or they'd have some peace and quiet. And it got done. And it wasn't long before erosion sediment started coming out of the east side of the Blue Ridge to the James and the Chesapeake to the point that landowners were permitted to take dump trucks and bulldozers and tractors and get gravel out of these rivers. We were having a huge amount of fine rock, alluvium, I guess, but really small stuff piling up. And when our family came here in the 70s, this was going on everywhere. And suddenly people got more concerned and more learned and they stopped the bulldozers from going in the river and basically destroying more of the river. There was a business of collecting the gravels from these rivers. And then we got into this era of environmental research to where if you did in a creek as the 29 bypass did around Sweetbriar College, if you did in that piece of river, you VDOT got stopped from doing your road until you could either fix something or mediate or do a restoration elsewhere to give some balance. And people started getting into uh, making money by having uh, places where you could do restoration projects. But this project was before that really became something. And so this project, believe it or not, was the first big project east of the Mississippi where man was trying to outwit Mother Nature in this restoration effort. And lots of mistakes were made. I think, Chuck, one thing that will happen over the next decade is an analysis of the work that was done, what the contractors started learning from those mistakes, and how 20 years almost of work on this river was a teaching for how to pursue restoration, environmental repair for the future. But you can't fool Mother Nature, but you can learn a lot. And I believe when you get a three and a four inch rain here and you go look at the streams near you running so brown 
you come over to the Camino Trailhead and you walk and you see clear water. So we have learned some things and are doing some things, but if there's a real story behind this restoration project, and Chuck posed the question, is it good or bad? I, I don't know that that will ever be answered. Yeah, and I look forward to talking about that when we're actually at the spot, because I think you can list the things that it does. Peter articulated a number of those. And then the things that it um, is either inhibiting a stream from doing. And he also made a point that there has been a long history of kind of uh, land use change. The Army Corps of Engineers obviously straightened channelized streams, which um, we know to be bad. But then you can go back to when um, the valley was first settled and this is turned into um, agriculture. Lots and lots of land use change happened then. And certainly uh, straightening of the streams has been going on um, since time out of mind. So the idea of restoration in the 21st century is a very reasonable concept, but it's kind of the devil in the details and the particular setting. So I have uh, burned the better part of an hour and you've been very patient with me. Um, so we talked about the Rockfish Valley, we talked about the hydrology, we talked a little bit about the geology and some of the restoration. And we're gonna go see that, at least those of you who are brave enough to come with me. And I'm also happy to take questions while we're still here. Here. If I could squeeze three questions in from our, uh, everybody at home. Sure. Uh, the first one is really, are there any long-term changes in the land, rock, et cetera, where geothermal is used in HVAC? Like, does uh, it have an impact? I would generally say the <laughs> geothermal that is used kind of in, in Virginia, is of such small scale and that you are recycling water in a very small part of a effectively an aquifer. Okay. So not necessarily so. However, in other environments, you can go to Iceland and places like that where lots of water are going through very hot rocks and you're using lots of it. Yes, that okay. potentially would be a bigger impact. Great. And if I could squeeze these other just two in really quick and then we'll take some others from here. Over geologic time, do you think that the Rockfish Valley will continue to widen? Or will the crest of the Blue Ridge move watershed, or will the crest of the, of the Blue Ridge move westward, robbing the Rockfish Valley of water? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, the Rockfish. That is a great question. And I was going to ask you guys that question. I really don't like being beaten to a question. <laughs> uh, so that's a little discouraging. But if you think about it, the Blue Ridge Parkway and the crest of the Blue Ridge is kind of the drainage divide of the Rockfish River. Everything coming into Nelson County goes to the Rockfish River and the James and Chesapeake. You're on the other side, you go to Back Creek and then into the Shenandoah River system. But is this boundary between these two basins going to stay in the same place over time? No. And I would argue generally no. And I think it's going to depend on the local geology. And typically, kind of the first sort of default answer would be the side that has the steeper reaches near the headwaters will encroach upon the other side. And so what that could mean, because there's a more significant fall on this side of the Blue Ridge than on the Shenandoah River side, is that the Rockfish River likely will capture little bits of terrain from the other side over time. We got one more. Right? One, one more on this, and then some of these questions can, uh, they can go outside, right? But uh, uh, are the stream restoration projects designed by people who've done the, uh, hold on, let me, let me keep this up. Are the stream restoration projects designed by people who've done the Rose, Rosegen courses, i.e. based on the Rosegen stream classification model? Uh, question mark. They were designed based on Western rivers and it is somewhat controversial to apply this technique to Eastern streams. That's right. In fact, this whole stream restoration thing is kind of a, a almost like a hornet's nest of issues because people have talked about restoring streams for a long time. And as I mentioned, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and at least in Virginia, and they did this in other places, were very reactionary. The idea is if you straighten and deepen a stream, high water will move out much more quickly, and so your floods will be less. Um, and then people recognized that was a bad idea. And so people started thinking about how would you restore streams back to a more um, natural environment? Some streams, especially ones out west, are prone to be extraordinarily flashy. That is, they're dry almost all the time. But then you can have catastrophic flooding that gets into places where humans are doing things. And so it started in the semi-arid or arid west. It was then, you know, sort of has come a long way. And as Peter said, we've learned things over time. 
And there certainly are streams in Eastern North America that need to be restored, sometimes for industrial pollution reasons, as much as water flow reasons. Um, so that was a little mealy mouth, but the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> All right, anybody else in here? Yeah, but I will say I like my quote up on the exhibit. It's right there behind you next to the water jet sign. Do you see it right there? Water and lot. Oh, yeah. No, go over to the top of the other, uh, up to the top. No. No, your watershed, your part of that what you're talking about now? I'm talking about. Here you go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about, and then I'll be quiet. I'm talking about. Water and rocks interact with each. Well, I don't know where it is. It's maybe not. I buried it. Water and rocks interact with each other, and to uh, create the past, the present, and the future. Because if I learned anything from Chuck and all of this, this is the present. But we have no idea what the future is going to look like. The same as what went before us. Mm -hmm. But the future, this whole area could look. Totally well, certainly, and obviously, there's the things like climate change and the hydrologic budget changes. Because climate drives hydrology, there will, you know, be changes that um, will certainly accrue in this system. All right, great. Well, that was an enjoyable hour, at least from my perspective. So, thank you. Well, I'll just say real quick. I can now give you all copies of the trail map and the stops. And what we're gonna do is let Jack go down. He'll open a gate where there'll be lots of parking. He'll direct you into where to park your car. And just be careful getting out on this road here. Uh, enough of you know to do that, but uh, we'll wait for everybody down there because we don't want you taking any chances. And uh, Thank you for being here. But right, you're going to turn left here and you're going to go one half mile. And you're going to go across a little bridge called the Rockfish. And immediately you'll see some wood fence and an entrance to the Camille Trailhead Parking, where you'll see a historic marker that commemorates the loss of life of two people named Ewing right at that spot in Camille. All right. Thank you. Thank you.